And joining me for the big story is Ramadan Gobi. He is an economist. Good morning, Ramadan. Good morning, Joel. I'm glad to be here. All right. If somebody asked you how Uganda's economy is doing in a sentence, what would that statement be? It is struggling. It is struggling. It has been struggling for the last six years. And mm. um, Government tell shows us gross, you know, glossy figures of our economic no, improvement. No, even the and government so has uh, admitted on several occasions that the economy is no longer performing the way it used to perform because uh, growth has subdued uh, as a result of uh, a number of, you know, uh, some internal, others exogenous factors. Mm. When you look at, uh, for example, GDP growth, it has never hit the target of 7% since 2010. Uh, when you look at uh, our per capita income growth, it's also not doing uh, quite well. It used to be one of the fastest growing per capita income rates in Sub-Saharan Africa. Today, it's not. But uh, leave alone those figures, come back to on-the-ground realities. The, what you, the people feel in their pockets, what they feel in their homes. I think, uh, by and large, business is down. Uh, the economy hasn't been uh, doing quite well. The central bank is coming in uh, because many of the business people that you talk about, they get loans from commercial banks and uh, the rates are through the roof and they keep changing. You know, today you get a loan at what, let's say 20%, you know, a few months down the road it will be 23% and you'll have to pay that, the bank doesn't want to know. Mm -hmm. The central bank keeps coming in every so often, they've now lessened the CBR, that's the central bank rate, by 1% from 15% to 14%. Mm -hmm. Positive effect, any? You see that? Um, you know, the... The method which Bank of Uganda uses of, uh, you know, interest, I mean, I I inflation targeting, mm. where they, they use the central bank rate to influence uh, commercial banks, has been uh, debated lately, uh, globally, whether it's effective, it can influence commercial banks to, you know, change their lending rates. You know, it's a rocket feather kind of scenario. Mm. When uh, the central bank increases the rate, the central bank rate, Commercial banks propel the interest rates like a, a, a rocket. Uh, but when uh, it reduces the, the, the central bank rate, then they leave them to reduce, to fall as, as a feather. You know how a feather f uh, falls. Mm. And so uh, I think it all goes back to our uh, economic kind of policy we have in the country. In some other countries where they use, again, inflation targeting, the, the, the central bank tends to have more muscle in uh, influencing commercial banks. Before you go further, I just need to be sure we are not leaving some of our viewers uh, on the wayside. Central bank rate, let's break it down. What does it mean? Mm. What kind of effect does oh. it have? The central bank rate is just a, a benchmark kind of rate. It's a, a rate to influence. It's a policy rate. It has nothing to do with the, the cost of money of which commercial banks borrow from the central bank. Uh, they borrow at a bank rate. That one is called a bank rate. But the central bank rate, for it, it's a policy rate. It was invented <coughs> to be a signal, to signal to commercial banks that when it moves in this direction, we are signaling to you to move in that direction. What ramifications are there if I don't? Because I might say, look, I have targets as a bank. I'm a private bank. I've got targets. I've got to hit them. So I'm going to keep my rate up there. Mm -hmm. What are the ramifications if I don't follow this? That's the point. There, there is no any kind of influence which the central bank has on commercial banks. They can only do much signal. And uh, yesterday, the central bank governor was asked actually this very question. And he said it very explicitly that uh, as central bank, they can't pressurize commercial banks uh, into reducing the rate. And now somebody sits back and says, then, why, what, what's your role as Bank of Uganda? Uh, are you just uh, there to, 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 to put up some figures which are not meaningful anyhow? So um, this is the debate, actually, which uh, even uh, throughout the week, of the central bank <coughs> a celebration of 50 years they have been uh, having uh, should we stay this course or should uh, the central bank change in its mandate and many of us believe that uh, it's time actually they changed the mandate all right let's talk about other things that are affecting this our economy you talked about it being a struggling economy yeah. the president <coughs> does admit and he says you know what one of the ways we can bolster this economy he wants to take us to middle income economy by 2020 i don't know if you believe that will happen mm -hmm. but uh, one of the ways he feels let's lessen this our wage bill you know according to him we have too many civil servants that are doing nothing 
let's cut down on the numbers. Mm -hmm. We'll have more money at our disposal and therefore we'll focus on the important things. You know, uh, somebody would ask why civil servants only? Because uh, I think uh, the president is right. Mm. <laughs> we can't uh, anymore sustain this. Uh, the, the, the government has grown so big, you know. Uh, there is this uh, the Thian kind of animal which we, we have in public policy where a government can uh, just explode, expand like a monster, and it has done that. When the NRM government came to power in 86, one year into power they realized they couldn't manage the public service kind of bill they had. And uh, they carried out a public sector reform in the beginning 1989, where they cut the number of ministries from about 30 to 22. They also reduced the, the, the size of public service from about 300,000 to 160,000. Today, we have gone back to where they started and actually uh, kind of uh, overshoot it. When you look at the number of ministries, they are replicated so much uh, and duplicated as well. You find uh, uh, now we have about 170 MDS, what they call ministries, departments, and agencies. Mm. All of them are taking money from government. So many, and they are not doing much in terms of delivering the service to, to the average uh, Ugandan. So someone would uh, sit back and say, why don't you just say, let us really do, redo the 1989-90 kind of uh, reforms which we had, and we reduce the size of government, right from uh, uh, the ministries, the cabinet, the parliament, then come to the civil service as well. Otherwise, you are going to go into this debate, which uh, uh, the Oxford Policy Management Firm uh, found in 2008, whereby uh, they said that w they brought them to review the PIP, the, 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 how it had performed, the Poverty Eradication Action Plan, uh, in preparation for the National Development Plan. And this is what they said, that if government does not attend to certain issues, principally the chaotic political uh, 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 administrative interface, that there was chaos between the way the two arms were working, the political arm and the administrative arm of government. Each of them were blaming the other. Today you will find that politicians, when they go to Chiangkwanzi, they are pointing the finger at civil servants. They are the ones who are not performing. The civil servants, when you engage them, they will tell you <laughs> the, the problem is the politicians. So I think uh, this ping pong kind of uh, game we, we have entered into points at the, the need for us to rethink again whether really we are on the right path in terms of uh, the size of government, the, 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 the kind of duties and, and, and the responsibility of various MDAs. So to me, it's not about only looking at the wage bill of the, uh, of the civil servants, but we need to look at the entire government and, the, the, and look at the cost of running it. I think this government has grown so big and it can't be run by the resources which we have. Let's talk a bit about MPs. There's been uh, bashing of MPs uh, yesterday, especially, and today it continues, as they're seeking for about 68 billion shillings for their cars, um, you know, another couple of billions for their iPads, and people are feeling, you know what, these are our leaders, they are nibbling away at our economy unnecessarily. So, one, there are too many, there are too many, a lot more than one would think we need, mm. but then also, that, that, that maybe we need to learn to cut our coat according to how much cloth we have. You know, their pay already is high enough. Yeah. And some feel maybe if we did that with some of these, we'd have more money to focus on the priorities. Is that the way you see it? But also, is it a possible thing to do? One, you know, I'm a very realistic human being. I always tell people that. Because one, I think MPs need cars. Absolutely. Their business. But the question should be which cars? I don't think an MP needs a four-cylinder uh, car, that expensive car. If he needs one, let him top up. I think we need to get a standard car for an MP. What, what do you mean by a standard car? Um, What's a standard uh, car? It can be a car in the range of, uh, you know, between 50 and 100 million. What kind of car are you talking about? 
Um, you, they can think of so many cars. You know, there are so many cars on our roads. I drive a car, you drive a car. We, we get to work. Yeah, we, and we get MP, also to the, our village. The MP will tell you, um, it's not like me who is always driving in town. Exactly. Also, it's just once in a while that I might go up country or that kind of thing. Mm. He's got to go there every weekend to move around the constituency, the roads are rugged and so on. That's the reasoning anyway that they do have. But uh, that doesn't mean that you have a strong car so for you to maneuver through the bad roads. You need actually to, to fix the roads and use a smaller car. For us to be uh, more realistic, we don't need to look at, at this uh, uh, as MP versus the people and the people versus the MPs. Mm. We need to get into one room and agree on certain basics. And I think where the people find the MPs being a, a bit uh, greedy is when they say we need a 300 million car. You know, uh, that one is quite expensive, for especially, especially given the number of those MPs and also the, the requirement of fueling these cars. The, the bigger the car, the more fuel it will guzzle and it's going all to go to the taxpayer. Uh, to me, I think uh, uh, we, can, uh, we can buy a leaf from other countries where you find that, like in Rwanda, there, there is a way they, they run their, their cost of the legislature. They, 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 first of all, they made these guys who own these cars. They buy it for you, you own it. You pay, you know, an installment of your uh, salary for a certain period. But the maintenance is on you. That makes, you know, the cost to be more realistic for, 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 for the taxpayers of Rwanda. And because this guy, this guy has a responsibility over his own car, it is his. Uh, other places, they have bought in Tanzania some, you know, uh, cars for them, but reasonable cars. But in Uganda, we are so luxurious in nature. When you look at the type of cars we have on our roads, especially with the red number plates, you know, you find even uh, uh, these uh, English... Uh, Range Rovers. Range Rovers, mm -hmm. with, the, with the government number plates. And you wonder, really, which type of government can allow such to happen? Is it that, because I'm looking at we, the citizenry, um, is, is it that we are docile, and forgive my usage of this language, because one would expect that we should put pressure on these, our leaders, mm. or is it that this pressure is not amounting to anything? Because people make noise on social media, they will tweet away, there are all these hashtags that trend and so on, but not much does result out of that. I think we do not have a way of uh, going into a cooperative game you know, uh, where mm. we can agree as people that uh, we are going to do ABCD and influence government to, to, to act on it. Our efforts are usually scattered. You will find uh, the best you're going on the streets and uh, then some people are running around, uh, you know, making some noise, us on treat also treating, but that doesn't make a lot of impact as far as government is concerned. But uh, two, why should government wait for, for such pressure? You know, some of these things, I look at them as common sense. If really you find that you are coming out of this political environment, which we have had, and also given the economy, <laughs> the way it is performing, why do you want to go into uh, these expenditures immediately after? which would uh, make everybody <laughs> look at government as being insensitive to the needs of people of Uganda. So to me, I think it's about uh, also government itself um, uh, looking into these matters and see what is more uh, rational and what is irrational. And to me, I think some of these expenditures, people will take them to be irrational. Okay. Hopefully that's the thing that gets to happen. We need our economy to get better. Ramadan Gobi, as always, pleasure having you. Thank you for talking to us. Thank you very much for hosting. Coming up is my opinion. All right, uh, I'll just do a very quick illustration. Um, this is a piece of paper. I'm going to make a cone. I know that uh, most of you know these cones for things like uh, Vinyobwa, G nuts, and, and the like, yeah? But this is the illustration that I want you to make. Okay, here you are. You can see it a lot more clearer. I understand Indians, uh, Indians and this little. No, no, no. The other way around, actually. Indians earn this, this much. Okay, and then they spend this little. Using this fun as an example, they earn this much, but they spend this little. 
Ugandans, on the other hand, uh, we earn this little and we want to spend this much. That goes for individuals, that goes for government, that goes for certain companies. And the question is, where is this money coming from? As a country, you have a certain budget, you look at your income, how much comes in, and it's important you cut your coat according to how much cloth you have. You look at certain ministries, you look at state house, you know, the supplementaries, billions of shillings, and that should be okay. We want our president, we want our leaders to live comfortably so they can serve us. But at what cost? Are these things that we can afford? Maybe we need to be a lot more reflective and become like the Indians who earn this much. We should begin to earn this much and we spend this little. There's no magic wand about it. That's how our economy will get better. And that's it for the big story today. Thank you for joining us. My name is Joel Senyonyi. Coming up in a bit is Everyday Life.